Guys, I would love to ask Angie, where are you? Angie Martin, come on up. All right. Y'all welcome Angie Martin to the stage. Awesome. Let's go. Excited about Angie. We've been talking about this for a good while now. Um, man, just being around the East Ridge fam and hearing her stories over the years, that's been so inspiring, so encouraging. If you have talked to Angie for even just a minute, you see the joy of the Lord in her and faith that is so deep. And uh, I'm excited to, to hear from her story. I would just like for us to pray for her. Um, we're, I have nerves right now. We all have nerves when we're up here. It's not... You know, we're not impervious because we do this often. So let's just pray um, that one of our family members would be able to share freely by the Spirit. Lord, that's exactly what we pray today. Thank you for Angie. Thank you for her obedience, Lord. Um, she's willing to come and share all of your goodness, all of your faithfulness. Thank you that you never leave us. You're always with us. We love you. And I pray that you would give her courage and confidence. Spirit lead her. We love you. Amen. Amen. Go get him, sister. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> I so appreciate him because he really does calm my nerves and help me. And I want to start by saying sometimes the Lord does not answer our prayers because I had asked for 10 people, and that's not what I got here. So <laughs> if you've ever seen the comic strip, The Family Circus, you remember that where the little boy was just going everywhere? You know, maybe today that might look a little like this, but like my husband would say, um, it's my story. I can tell it how I want to, right? So my name is Angie, and I am married to Scott Martin. We've been married for almost seven years. We have, um, gosh, seven kids between us <laughs> and six grandkids. And um, we are retired, but I would never know that. I work harder now than I've ever worked, and so does he. So um, we're grateful for um, how the Lord has moved in our lives and, and letting us have a front row seat to our kids and grandkids. The Lord's faithful and good all the time, and I hope that you'll be encouraged today after I share a few things. So um, I want us to feel like we're at a campfire setting today, you know, and just kind of telling my story. And we've heard such great stories already from Joseph about anxiety and coming to the Lord for rest and peace. Um, and from Mr. Don and the Isaiah that the Lord gives strength to the weak and um, power to us when we need it. Um, we heard from John and Sally Krieger and uh, about the faithfulness of God sustaining them through their child's um, cancer bout for a decade or so. And it's just been so um, encouraging. And, and I just, I wish all of you guys, I wish we could do this like all the time and y'all could all stand up and tell your stories and we would just be so encouraged in the faith. So, you know, think about sharing your story with somebody after you leave here today, because I think today's the last day of our, our story sharing. So I would just encourage you talk about the things the Lord's done. There was a time in my life I didn't want to talk about it because I didn't know what to say or what if I said something wrong and what if I misrepresented the Lord and that's just being delivered from a spirit of fear. That's all that is. So we'll just ask for that and get on with it and go ahead and make fools of ourselves. I'll tell you a, a story where I did make a fool of myself one time um, in just a minute. I'm going to do a five-minute testimony. At five or six years old, my parents were committed to taking me and my brother and sister to church every Sunday but before we would go to church, we would go buy Krispy Kreme donuts. So in my brain, I equated Krispy Kreme donuts and church, and I've kind of been obsessed with both ever since. So I, I, yeah, it's a shame. I tried, I wanted to get 300 donuts and bring them, and so they'd be sitting outside, and Inglis didn't have any. Kroger had one dozen. So my plan failed. So um get you a donut sometime and think of that, you know? Um, so at um, age 12, we were going to a Presbyterian church. My dad served as deacon. And, um, and then my parents had bought a farm down here in New Bern. And so we'd come down every weekend. And, and me and my sister, our two best friends, we'd drag them with us. And we went to Mansfield Baptist Church. This was, oh, oh gosh, I can't do the math. Anyway, I was 12. And um, and one Sunday, the, the pastor gave an invitation, and my heart started beating fast, my knees were shaking, and the whole nine yards, I thought, Lord, what, what is happening? And it was one of those, uh, just an invitation to come. So I grabbed my two best friends and my sister, and we walked down that aisle, and we said yes to Jesus for the first time. And, um, and ever since then, the Lord's just been, um, like, inviting me, like you, into a life of prayer, 
So at 15 years old, we were in a Baptist church by then, and my whole family on one, in one day on Sunday got baptized together, and I would highly recommend that. It was one of the most beautiful days in my spiritual journey thus far. And then at 18 years old, I had graduated high school, went to University of West Georgia, where I tried out for the tennis team and my sister, and um, we made it. And our, pa- our uh, not pastor, our tennis coach was um, charismatic. Well, I would, had grown up in a Presbyterian church and a Baptist church, and we did not hear that much about the Holy Spirit, really. We just didn't. So I began to get super hungry for, like, who is this third person of the Trinity? And, um, and I wanted to learn about him. So I would pick my past, I mean, my coach's brain when we travel to different states to play tennis. And, and I learned a lot. I would ask my Baptist pastors, my youth pastors, our Presbyterian friends. I'd ask all of them, like, what is this about the Holy Spirit? And, uh, and I wanted to befriend him like I, wanted, like I had befriended God and the Son. That was kind of easy because God the Father, he loves me and that's good. And then, and then Jesus died for me. I mean, what's not to love that he laid down his life? And then the Holy Spirit was just, what? Who? And so um, uh, I began to take that seriously and like dive into the word. Like John chapters 13, 14, 15, 16 have amazing um, uh, words about the Holy Spirit, who he is in us, our comforter and our counselor, and that he lives inside of us now. So um, one night I was about 20, I was a freshman in college, and my friend uh, Chris uh, was one of my dear friends in, in college at the time. Well, I woke up at 12 midnight one night, and, and I had that whole feeling and that heart racing and my knees were shaking. All I thought, what is happening? and went to pray. So I started praying. I prayed for like a while, a long time. And don't think I do this all the time because I don't. But this one time, I feel like the Lord was just, (laughs) this will be fun. And so I prayed for a little while. And then I started thinking, oh gosh, I got to call Chris. Well, I don't call boys at 2 a.m. And I I haven't done it since. I haven't called anyone in the middle of the night. But this night, it was one of those, I have to do this. So I call, pick up the phone. I call him pick up the phone. I had to walk to the kitchen. That was when we had cords on our phones, you know, and no cell phones. So, um, and I said, he answers the phone, hello. And I'm like, oh God, of course I woke him up, you know? And um, I said, I, I, and I've been praying. I just kind of, and I fumbled through telling him that I was praying for him and I was praying for his mom. And I said, I, I just, I need, I just want to say to you that your mom's going to be okay. I just, I really feel like the Lord's going to give you peace. And I'm just him hawing and doing my best. And he's like, Okay, I Mari Ange. I was like, okay, bye. So I felt foolish and like, what in the world? But then the next morning, or about 12 o'clock, he called. He said, I want to tell you what was happening last night. He said, um, he said, I was standing beside my mom's hospital bed and she had attempted suicide. And I thought, oh my goodness. The fact that the Lord would invite me to pray for something so heavy and huge, I was hooked. She is well and healthy and whole to this day. Her name is Mary and she's a delight. And we've all, you know, we've all gone through these ground zero times in our lives like Mary did. My ground zero, and what I mean by that is a time in my faith where my faith world came crashing down into powder. My college best friend, Sherry, and I had our first babies two hours apart. We, it wasn't planned, of course. Who could plan that? And our second child was two and a half months apart. And um, I'm, I'm, we're in the hospital together. I'm nursing my baby, and her baby's born, Madison Faith. And she had her pulmonary artery was switched. So she needed to have surgery, and she did not make it. And uh, she lived to be nine days old. Uh, I sang at the funeral. It was certainly heart-wrenching. And um, hearing a mother's cry down a hospital corridor was something that, you know, I'll never forget. But what had happened was I I, um, got to that place in life where I realized I had been creating God the way I wanted him to be. And what I mean by that Oh, by the way, that's the sin of pride. <laughs> what I meant by that was, um, you know, if I did things his way, oh, naturally he should do things my way. And my way is not nine-year-old, nine-day-old babies dying or any other tragic things like this. So I started 
grappling with our brokenness and the broken world that we live in and the pride of my own heart that wanted to make God into this heavenly bellhop to do my bidding (laughs) instead of uh, the other way around, me do his bidding and serve him. It's a little embarrassing to share that, but I, I know I'm not alone in pride. I think pride is like the biggest yuck ever, Adam and Eve. And, you know, and so I feel like you could relate in some ways. The way that pride has manifested in my own life is through insecurity. It's through people pleasing. It's through sarcasm, which was one of my favorite ways to tease. Um, but things like that, that, that it's about, it becomes about me instead of about the Lord you know, and what the Lord said about um, giving him glory and not getting glory to ourselves. He said, this is the two things that it'll, that we'll know we're glorifying God is bearing fruit and being his disciple. Um, something I learned about a disciple is that uh, <laughs> that word itself, it means to train. So when I had children and was raising them, I remember the Lord saying, you're training them. Discipline is not no, 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 no. Discipline is yes, 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 yes. And training them in the ways that, you know, of the Lord, the ways you want them to go. And so uh, one of the things that my mom has said my whole life is, Ange, be a yes girl. And she was a yes girl. And she would go on adventures, all of them. She went to Japan with her best friend one time, which I would be like, no, I, what? By yourself? So, you know, just the two of you. She said yes to everything. She loved and she gave generously. And all of it sprung from a heart that said yes to God in the best way she knew how. And that's all all of us are doing is saying yes to God in the best way we know how. And so being a disciple of God is just saying yes. Um, one of the fastest tracks of spiritual growth is obedience. Like, well, duh, you know, of course it is. But there's this great scripture in first, a great scripture, like some of them are not so great. And in, um, in first John 2, 3 through 6, um, they talk about, it, John talks about knowing God, loving God, and obeying God. And when we get on that track in our life, I want to know you, God. I want to love you. I want to be loved by you. I want to obey you. Boy, that's a fast track. So um, a second a fast track, track to growth and grace, I might add. There were a couple of other times in my life that were ground zero. One was when my, one of my closest five friends, Chloe, um, she died at 38 years old of cancer after having had her fourth baby three months before. That was a tough one, uh, obviously, to get through. So the next thing was... Um, I went, I was married 19 years to my first husband and we, uh, we did not, we could not, did not make it work. My heart had grown hard. I was, I had contempt in my heart for him, um, pursued, pursued divorce and we went through a five day jury trial, ha, 13 month deliberation and, uh, litigation mess. So at the end of that, I was pretty crushed. And I moved back home, which was here with my parents. And I came in here and I sat over here in 2009, about the middle of the row there. And I would just come in here and cry and cry and cry. I was probably at a, a most broken place I had been in, in my life. And the Lord used this body of believers to bring healing to my heart. And he will do that when we let him. I remember Scott and Tracy Moore were about to adopt Cage at the time. And I had been in a ministry that was, it was prayer and worship, and it was about intercession. And it was, you know, it was based on the Samuel scripture about, oh, loosely based, that Samuel said, far be it from me to sin against the Lord by not praying for you. Well, I looked at Scott and Tracy And, you know, Jesus, you know, is our high priest and he's gone before us and he's our great intercessor. And watching their life and them adopt a baby made me realize like intercession is not just a bunch of words to speak to the Lord. um, And that's it. Prayers have to have feet is one of my deepest convictions. (laughs) And what I mean by that, there needs to be action. 
So when Tracy and Scott adopted Cage, I remember being like, that is the picture of intercession. It's taking the hand of God and finding a need and connecting the two. And they stood in the gap for this baby. And now we get to watch Cage and Trenton. And, and now uh, um, August, baby, Kurt and Tara's baby. And we get to watch them live a life of interceding. Being that person who stands in the gap and holds this person who needs God and God's hand. And be that to them. And so I watched Scott and Tracy love one another. I watched, I, I was so broken. Honestly, truth is, I was a man hater, man hater. I was like, I'm never getting married again. He certainly won't have blue eyes because my ex did. Scott has blue eyes. And, um, you know, the Lord will laugh too like that, I think, at our plans sometimes. So um, the Lord began to just, uh, I'd get in, I got in divorce care here and I got in growth groups and, and you know, sometimes you have to kiss a few growth group frogs, but just keep going because I mean, this is, this is what the Lord does. He heals us through the body. You know, when our own body gets hurt, if I fell off the stage right now, I might hurt my leg and I'm going to, oh, I'm going to grab my leg. But it takes all of me to heal that. And if we look at it as the body of believers, we want to heal each other. And then when we do stupid things, like I had an epic, epic friendship fail almost two years ago next month. And I cried for weeks at what I had. I had forgotten a hugely, hugely important part of one of my dearest friend's life. We were traveling, they were traveling, and it just was like the perfect storm for me to do something stupid and forget to to acknowledge and to say something to her. I, we talked, she gave grace upon grace upon grace, and she didn't have to, but she knows the Lord well enough to know this is my job. We extend grace to each other. We ask for forgiveness, and the Lord heals. So this, this group of believers, this body, the Lord used to heal my heart, and I'm so grateful for the growth groups that I'm in now, that I'm involved in. Y'all, I would not I don't know where I'd be right now <laughs> if, um, if I did not have this uh, growth group that I'm in. And, and it, it, like anything, you're going to get out of it what you put into it, you know? So I approached the growth group wholeheartedly with open arms and an open heart, you know? And um, my current season that I'm in now is, um, is a season of deep grief. <laughs> um, my mother... Uh, passed away last November uh, after a 14-year-old year battle with Parkinson's disease. And um, the last five years were really uh, obviously tough. And then, and then the closer we got, the tougher it became. But I saw God's faithfulness and mercy. We had prayed for mercy. And I remember asking the Lord to let her passing be peaceful. And he very much did honor that in the most gracious and beautiful way. I had been in a grief share group here in town at Connection Point and where I met Judy Cannon. Actually, I don't know if she's here today, but um, the, the main people that were speaking in that group, it was a video that we watched, his father had died of Parkinson's disease. And so when I heard that, and it was because he fell, he fell and a clock from the wall hit him in the head, the end. And I just thought, oh God, and it oh, reawakens fears of how she might die. And that all, it was just awful when that fear comes into your life in such an overwhelming way. Um, she, at the end of her life, went to bed on, on October 23rd last year. And uh, for 24 days, she was in the bed. And the lesson that I learned, I thought that you know, when I say the lesson that I, I'm not trying to say my mom's death is so God could teach me a lesson. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say the Lord's grace and mercy and faithfulness carried me um, through the love of my dad, my sister and brother, my nieces and nephews, my children, all of them. The Lord has loved and carried me through and the faith community. But one of the things that's so difficult when you're watching someone that you love um, slowly be finished with her body is the circumstance says this is death. 
This is it. This is final. But the truth says, I am the resurrection and the life. And um, we grieve with hope. And um, so my fight was not about uh, some spiritual rulers in high places because Yes, there's spiritual battle and warfare and things like that, but I personally believe that the minute my hands go up and I go, mm, you're worthy of it all, the enemy runs. He doesn't want to hear that stuff. So that's the way that I fight <laughs> the enemy. I just worship. So she, um, uh, she, she laid there for 24 days, and um, I can remember crying scream crying in the car after I left her house one night. And I was screaming to Jesus saying, I don't want this to be the end. I don't want this to be the end. Um, And it was like his presence was so strong. And this felt like one of those, if I go up to the heavens, you're there. And he said to me, Angie, this isn't the end. I'm the end. I'm the beginning and the end. This is not the end. So having the Knowing the word of God and the God of the word, it, it just, there's just no other way to live. One way that I did um, at these ground zeros in my life, I always go back to Psalm 139, 17. And um, Jesus said in a couple places that this is our work. This is our work is to believe. That's so easy. This is your work to believe. And how do we believe? Faith comes by hearing the word of God. And so I remember my mentor at the time saying, have you ever taken one Bible verse and just dove deep into that one verse? And I was like, no, you know, I got to read the Bible in a year and I got to read the chapter a day and I got to, you know, that kind of thing. He said, take a month and read one verse. And so I picked Psalm 139, 17, and I read that thing and I prayed it and I sang it and I wrote it and it was steering wheel and bathroom mirror and all the things for a month until I began to believe how precious toward me and about me, God, are your thoughts and how vast is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand And I began to believe that God loved me. God so loved the world, yes, but I began to take it personally. He loves me. And then I began, it was like he opened the eyes of my heart to see how he loves me. I take sunrises so personally. (laughs) <laughs> There's a song we used to sing in church that you paint the skies for me to see. I take sunsets personally. I take sitting on the beach and feeling that ocean breeze personally. It's a way he loves me. Mountain air and sitting there with coffee on a balcony somewhere, that's the way he loves me. In the mundane every day of life with a husband who learned to love uh, at sort of at the hands of losing a wife. Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you in John 15, 12. And if we don't know how he loves us, we won't know how to love. And that's where I was. I knew Bible verses, but I didn't know how to love. So I spent some time, and I'm talking about as recently as last month, because I have a bereavement coach. I spent time in counseling learning how to, one, love myself, like the second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. If we don't even love ourselves, we sure can't do a good job loving our neighbors. It was like one of the counselors said to me, it's like you are baking a cake for somebody, a chocolate cake, a big juicy one with caramel inside of it. And you think, I'm doing so, I'm baking them a cake. And you give it to them, and, but you didn't know they're a type one diabetic. Uh. So then our efforts become, uh. You know, so we, we need to know ourselves, love ourselves, get help. When you struggle with pride, that's the best prayer you can play, pray is, Lord, help me. And then seek out ways to be helped. Seek out counselors. Now, counselors are like growth groups in that you got to kiss a few frogs there too sometimes. But, you know, but the Lord will lead you and bring you to that person who, who can Help the Lord to heal your heart. You know, partner with the Lord. The Lord doesn't need help. Partner with the Lord to heal your heart so that we can be people continuously who love 
the way he loves us. Um, I don't uh, how, what time is it? How, where's Scott England? <laughs> right, what time am I supposed to stop? <laughs> See, I love y'all. That's so sweet. <laughs> um, uh, actually, I think I'm, I don't know, I'm done. Ooh, one, one more. Because sweet Miss Alice, who, you know, I think she came to this church the day after. Like, like you know, Jesus left the earth and brought the Holy Spirit. And then the next day, Alice started coming to this church. <laughs> right, Miss Alice? Where is she? Um, <laughs> she, uh, she said, tell us something about Scott. Ooh. So before I close, I, I just got to, and I leaned over to him during worship. I said, is it okay if I tell this story? And he said, no. <laughs> just know I'm that girl. Um, Scott and I, we really have fun. Oh, oh, I could tell on myself. Nope. It's my story. I'll tell it the way I want to. So I'm not going to tell that one. I have a horrible, 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 um, uh, the thing I like to do, I, I kind of like, sometimes I like to scare people. <laughs> so what I did was, you know, and I, oh man, y'all, I'll be drinking water and think of a way to scare somebody and spew the water out of my mouth. That, that's how much fun I have with this. Well, we got these posts in our house and, and I got down behind one and he was coming in the house. And when he came in, I just went at him and barked like a dog. <laughs> See, I don't have any pride left to do something like that. But his response was beautiful. He did this little mm, thing. <laughs> he did a, a knee jerk. And so now, you know, I'll be like, if we go out to a wedding, are you going to do your dance? You know, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Hun. <laughs> Scott and I uh, got married on a dam at my, uh, uh, right near my parents' house. And so we like to say we had a dam wedding and went to Alabama for our honeymoon. <laughs> We love it. Um, you know, God gives us this river of living water inside of us. And I grew up in creeks. Did anybody else in rivers? Oh, my goodness. Put me in the woods. Sometimes these creeks, you know, leaves would fall in them. I don't know, rocks, different junk, trash might come in them. And sometimes that happens to us, you know, on the inside. This river of life becomes crowded with maybe issues, problems with the world, whatever, problem, our own stuff. And repentance is just getting before the Lord and going, I, I really want that out, Lord. I don't want that in my, in my river of life, you know? And he's so faithful and just when we confess those things to each other. And a good place to do that, obviously, is in family relationships, in, in church family relationships, if you have it. But I, I'm like Scott England when he said we do communion every week. It's like every week. But in my pride, I will tell you, in my early 30s, I can remember sitting before the Lord going, I can't think of any way that, I've, <laughs> that I'm sinning. <laughs> and uh, whew, that's so embarrassing to admit, but there it is. And, um, and then I refer back to David's Psalm. See if there's any offensive way in me. Now, on a Sunday morning, I'll be like, Lord, I know. I have done something dumb this week, and I'm sorry, and I don't want it, and cleanse me. I know you're faithful to cleanse me, and I love these moments to come together and, and get right before the Lord and not lean in my own self-righteousness or what I know about the Bible, but maybe not be putting into practice or most likely not be putting into practice, you know? So know God, love God, obey God. And then we, I began to understand seasons in my life that if I go to the heavens, you're there, like we read. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, get married on a dam, you're there. If I settle by the far side of the sea, crying in a church pew, totally broken with hopes and dreams shattered, he's there. Even there, his hand will guide me and his right hand, which is Jesus, will hold me fast. So I just want to live my life holding unswervingly back to him. So I want to read over us in closing Ephesians chapter 3. And it's a prayer that Paul prayed um, about the love of God. And I just want to pray that over us so that we will be a group of people who excel in loving God and loving one another the way that he loves us. 
And if you have a question about, Lord, where would I even start loving you? I don't know. How do I see your face? Where is your face? Hospitals, streets, prisons, foster homes. That's where the Lord is. And I think he's waiting on all of us to read his word, see where the need is, and go get it. And go take that need to the Lord and make them, uh, put them together. So um, Ephesians 3, verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Thank you for letting me share. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Angie. Y'all, she could tell, she could take each one of those stories and tell you all amazing God things that's happened in her life with each one of them that she didn't have time for today. So if you get a minute, sit with her. Um, just wanted to clarify, there are three different Scots she was talking about today, by the way, in case you didn't know. Her husband, Scott Martin, Pastor Scott Moore, and Scott England. We're totally different people, but just make sure you know that. <laughs> Some people are like, this is getting really weird. Um, but anyway, thank you so much, Angie. Um, she actually asked that we would close with this song today. Um, it's called Goodness of God, and it truly is a story of God's faithfulness and goodness. And so what I'd like to do is uh, actually ask the prayer team to come. Um, if you're here and you're on the prayer team, come down. We have a team of people that are committed to pray not only here during the service, but throughout the week, as we all do. But specifically, this is what they're, they do. It's part of the way they serve. If you would like for somebody to, come on, Amy, you good? Y'all can come on down. If you would like for somebody to pray for you, maybe something that you heard today, um, the Holy Spirit has pricked your heart or convicted you in some way, and you would like for someone to pray for you, come down and see one of these prayer team members here. Do um, we have any guys, any of the prayer team guys? There's Jason. Jason's coming. Great. Um, and if you would like to just come and pray here, we call it the altar, this holy place, this place that we set apart to just pray, you can come and pray by yourself. And if you want to pray by yourself, no one will come pray for you. You'll be there all by yourself to pray with the Lord. You can pray in your seat. But I just want to encourage you as we sing this song, um, don't leave without responding to what the Lord has been speaking in his still small voice to you today. Okay, it's so easy to just suppress the still small voice and ignore those things and keep moving. So during this song, it's like a three-minute song. We want to invite you to sing if you want to sing. You can sit, you can stand, you can pray, however the Lord leads you to pray. But be thinking about, God, what do you want to say to me? What has he already said to you and how you want to put it into action? Maybe you just need to rest in the fact that he loves you and he's faithful and he's going to carry you through this season. But maybe you need to respond in some way. You know exactly what that is. So I'm going to leave that to you. We're going to sing the song of gratitude and then I will just close us out in prayer. Yes, Lord, we sing of your goodness. We sing because our lips will declare how amazing and wonderful and right and righteous and faithful you are. Thanks, God, that we're your kids. Thanks that you are Father, the Holy One, the one who is worthy of all of our praise. God, thanks that we get to go and leave this place displaying the goodness of God to everybody in our lives. God, be with us during this week. Help us to cling to you, be in your word, led by your spirit and a light to this world until we gather again next week. We love you. Everybody said, amen. See y'all next week.